the NVIDIA executive who started its AI push, joins us to talk about what makes the company so indispensable, unpacking the secrets to its success. That's coming up right after this. Welcome to Big Technology Podcast, a show for cool-headed, nuanced conversation of the tech world and beyond. We have a great conversation for you today. We're going deep inside NVIDIA with Brian Catanzaro. He's the Vice President of Applied Deep Learning Research at NVIDIA, and he's going to be speaking at the company's forthcoming GTC conference, March 18th to 21 in San Jose. And his conversation is going to be specifically on practical AI, AI agents that reason and code at scale. So if you're in the area or you're thinking about heading out, you can mark that down. But let's get to the conversation. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Great to have you. You're kind of the guy that kicked off this whole AI push within NVIDIA. <laughs> Well, you know, it took a whole company to to transform NVIDIA into what it is today. So um, there's tens of thousands of people that der deserve a lot of credit. But um, I was uh, honored to be one of the people that helped NVIDIA get started a long time ago. Exactly. So maybe we can get into that in a bit. But I first want to talk to you really about what makes NVIDIA so indispensable to developers building with AI. I mean, that's been everything that's been going on recently it just comes back to... The fact that NVIDIA has these capabilities, right? And I think that a lot of folks hear about it. They understand it philosophically. We know that NVIDIA has the technology and that other competitors have, you know, have struggled to catch up. But let's just focus on NVIDIA for a moment. What is exactly happening within your company? What do you offer that allows anyone that wants to build AI and then run AI models to do it effectively? NVIDIA is an accelerated computing company. and Wait, wait. So what does that mean, accelerated computing? I hear you guys talk about it all the time. We've been talking about it for a long time, and the world still doesn't quite understand it. So I'm glad to, to try to explain it. Um, the idea is that the world faces a lot of computational challenges that can't be solved without faster computers. But uh, building a computer uh, is not enough. In order to actually deliver acceleration, all of the pieces have to line up and plug together and be fully optimized across the entire stack so that uh, people have the chance to do things that they just couldn't do otherwise computationally. And AI is a great example of that. You know, training and deploying uh, the awesome generative models that are changing the world right now is extraordinarily computationally intensive. It's the biggest computational challenge the world has ever faced. And uh, the reason that NVIDIA is uh, is is providing something useful here is because for for decades we've taken on this mission of optimizing the entire stack to build um, software algorithms libraries frameworks compilers systems networking chips the whole thing and optimize them together for the most important workloads uh, and and that's AI. Okay, and so when I hear you recite that you know list of different things you do, you know, the, the layman knowledge that would come in with, with and hear that, like if, I've, if I'm hearing that for the first time, I would say, wait a second, no, NVIDIA just does the H100 chip. So sure. it's obviously more than that. So can you talk a little bit about like people, I think, you know, they might get it wrong that it's just the chip. And that's the thing that gets the, gets the headlines, 20000 to $40,000. Facebook has 350,000 of them by the end of the year. That's what right. people need to run AI. But it's it's actually, and I think this is the important part, the ecosystem. It's not just right. the, the chip, but everything around it. So just talk about that as, you know, in layman's terms, if you can, like what surrounds that chip that NVIDIA provides? Well, um, there's, a, there's an entire culture about... Um, what is accelerated computing? We have to be very strategic about what we're going to accelerate. Uh, and we have to make decisions years in advance about how we're going to build the software and hardware that's going to provide this acceleration. Um, I always like to say that accelerated computing implies decelerated computing because it's not actually helpful to say, I'm just gonna make a fast computer. Everybody makes a fast computer, right? That's the goal of every computer is to be fast. So acceleration really is about specialization. It's about being able to focus and prioritize and say, this is the workload that matters most, and I'm going to optimize the entire stack for that workload. Uh, so in order to do that, we have an enormous amount of um, hardware, software, 
and algorithms that, that we're working on in order to enable the community to do things that they could never do before. Sometimes we like to say that we're building a time machine for scientists and engineers uh, that allows them to see into the future because of the acceleration that comes from our systems. So it's interesting because if you think about like a traditional chip company, and by the way, I might be totally off base on this and correct me if I am, but what they do is take you, you, the manufacturer will buy the chip, put it inside, let's say their computer, right? And then build all the software around it. But you guys also build, you not only manufacture the chip, but you build the, the algorithms and the software that surrounds it. So that enables companies to get the most out of it. So uh, just, Three questions on that one. Is that a right characterization of what you're doing? Um, and then, well, let's just start with that one. I'm not going to. Yeah, I, I think yeah. so. I mean, the, the core thesis that powers NVIDIA is that a chip could never be enough. You know, um, just, just the same way that a chip couldn't be enough for my Apple phone, for example. You know, Apple makes awesome chips, but the experience of using my phone uh, is a lot more than the chip. And you know the way that Apple's able to vertically integrate and optimize um, their entire system in order to create an amazing consumer experience, I think is is pretty incredible and, and super valuable. What NVIDIA is doing is uh, not the same, but it, it's related in the sense that we understand that the value of the technology we create is only understood in composition, in context. It's really about are we delivering acceleration, transformative acceleration to the most important computational workloads of our time? So why couldn't other companies then just go and build their own software to train using NVIDIA chips or other chips? Because it seems to me like, correct me if I'm wrong here also, but if I'm reliant on NVIDIA's software, it's closed source, right? So I'm gonna train my model with it. Um, it's kind of difficult to switch to another chip. So. Why, why well, particularly rely on the NVIDIA software? Yeah, I mean, we, we have a lot of open source software as well as some closed sor source software. Um, you know, we, we make the decision about what to open source based on what we think is going to help the market most. But I mean, the reason why people work with us is because uh, we deliver transformational acceleration. We enable people to do things computationally that they just couldn't do. And we know that it would never be enough to just provide a chip that said it was really fast and had like a lot of operations per second inside the chip, because the, the gap between, um, you know, what a particular chip can do and what the experience of a science scientist or engineer trying to invent the future, uh, that, that gap is quite enormous. Um, and uh, if any one of the links in that chain, whether we're talking about systems design or networking or data center design or the compilers, frameworks, libraries, um, applications, algorithms, you know, if any, any of those links um, are to fail, the acceleration is lost and the value therefore is lost. And mm -hmm. so NVIDIA has a unique way of approaching this problem, uh, co-optimizing the entire stack in order to deliver that acceleration to the end uh, scientists and researchers that are trying to invent the future. And that's what differentiates us from other companies. Now, uh, could other companies do that? I mean, absolutely. It's it's uh, it's not a secret. In fact, we've been shouting it from the rooftops for decades that this is what we do and that it's different from being a chip company. But you know, we're we're continuing to test that thesis. You know, is there value in accelerated computing that's above and beyond uh, what you get just from uh, making and selling awesome chips? And and I think the answer to that is yes. And you know, I think that's the reason why we've been so successful. Right. And to me, I think this is just for anyone listening, like I spent the whole week making calls on NVIDIA trying to figure out because I was wrong. I thought that like the everything would kind of slow down this year. And I was like speaking to customers and analysts tell me exactly what I missed. And to, and this was the thing that I underestimated, which is that it's not just the chip, but it's the chip, the software and everything that goes along with it. And that's why the company has been so successful. So let's talk a little bit about like what it actually goes into training an AI model. So do you, you have companies, let's say an open AI or whoever it might be that says, okay, I'm ready to train a model. Do they then get in touch with NVIDIA and be like, this is what I'm looking to do. And then you help them figure out how many chips they need, what pieces of software they need to, to train and everything else that comes along with that. 
we have um, a really great set of relationships with um, institutions around the world that are building AI, and we're always trying to um, help them get the benefits of accelerated computing uh, in whatever way makes sense to them. Obviously, um, every institution is going to have a different um, perspective on what they're trying to do, and they're going to have different secrets that they need to keep as part of their strategy about how they go to do, go, go to do that. And we respect that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we do try to help them understand what's possible uh, with our systems and make sure that, you know, they're actually getting the, the transformational acceleration that we expect. Um, so we do partner pretty closely with, with a lot of uh, important customers. I think one of the things that's special about NVIDIA is that it is a supporting and sustaining uh, kind of interaction when we work with our customers. Um, uh, NVIDIA technology is integrated into the heart of many different companies from amazing uh, AI institutions like OpenAI to um, uh, very uh, established uh, companies that do manufacturing or consumer products um, or self-driving or, you know, basically every aspect of, of the world's economy. NVIDIA is able to um, uh, provide technology at the level that um, makes sense for, for companies to use. Uh, if they'd like um, us to, to provide uh, just systems and they want to write all the software, um, you know, they can write as much software as they want. If they want to use all of our software, uh, you know, that's great too. Um, and we're just trying to help support and sustain uh, all of the different companies as they use AI for their own work. Right. And so let just let's walk through a little bit about like how this actually happens. So let's say I'm an organization. Uh, I come to NVIDIA, say I have a bunch of data or maybe I even don't have data and I'm looking to build a large language model. Um, what do I do now? <laughs> <Deep breath. laughs> that's a great question. You know, the, the first thing that's on my mind is like, you know, what data center are you going to use to train this model in? Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's that's a really important question uh, because it turns out that uh, the AI market is growing pretty fast because there's so many institutions that are training these huge models. And you actually have to have a building to put these machines in and they're they're not small. Uh, and you need to hook it up to power, you know, so that that would be one of my first questions is like, OK, are are you ready? Uh, to stand this up, or um, are you going to be working with a CSP, like for example, AWS? You know, um, and we love we love to support our customers um, through through cloud providers as well. Okay, and so then what happens next? Let's say I'm set up. <laughs> You're set up. Okay, so um, uh, we will definitely point you to our reference implementations of the various uh, LLMs and their training. Uh, setups on uh, these clouds. We'll show you um, how to scale it to, you know, many thousand GPUs efficiently. Um, we'll, we'll tell you what kind of speed you should expect uh, to get while training the model. And we'll um, also, you know, uh, discuss things about reliability. Um, you know, how do we make sure that the, the job is actually progressing properly and yielding, you know, intelligence. Um, you know, so we, we, we definitely um, help our customers with things like that. Um, I think also then when the model's trained, uh, there's a question about how do we deploy it, you know, mm -hmm. and we, we'd love to, um, uh, to, to help people deploy AI as well. I think um, uh, Jensen said in the earnings call this week that somewhere around 40% of our data center um, GPUs were, were going for inference, which I think is, um, you know, pretty amazing and, and definitely a, a shift from where things have been a few years ago. Um, and so uh, we're spending a lot more time helping our customers accelerate the deployment of these models as well, making sure that they get, you know, the best um, uh, uh, speed uh, so that they can, you know, get, get as much out of the systems they're deploying these models on as possible. And what are they using the models for? Um, I think that, you know, uh, language models are starting to be used in a lot of different parts of uh, a lot of different companies. Um, uh, things like question answering, um, uh, I, I think are really important um, to help help uh, people understand uh, answers to their, their specific questions, especially relating to um, private data stores that, um, that they need to answer questions with. Um, you know, I think we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, people use uh, AI in office type settings. I don't know if you've, um, interacted with Microsoft Copilot at all, but um, it sure. can be 
really helpful, uh, at least to me, when I'm looking at um, a summary of a meeting and what the the action items are for everybody at the meeting. Um, you know, uh, and, and other sort of office automation uh, tasks. Um, you know, we're also pushing forward with uh, the use of these models for our own internal work. At NVIDIA, we have a project called Chip Nemo that is um, uh, using language models to help our chip designers and, and uh, verification efforts be more efficient as we build our own um, products. It's called Chip Nemo? Yeah. Is, is that similar? I mean, I was just speaking with service now. There's also, they're also using a program from NVIDIA called Nemo. To, that's correct. Yeah. And that's right. what it is. It's they use it. That's oh, like, what is that software that they use to propel their question answering? Yeah. Nemo is, is kind of our um, uh, uh, most user-friendly uh, open source software for training and fine tuning language models and, and other kinds of conversational AI um, it, it also has a lot of speech capabilities as well. And, uh, you know, we've been building it for quite a few years because we believed that uh, conversational AI was really going to transform uh, industry. We wanted uh, to make a platform for companies to build their own, build, build and deploy their own conversational AI. So that's what, that's what mm -hmm. Nemo is. And uh, so when we talk about chip Nemo, we're talking about using that uh, for our own, own chip work. Wait, yeah, how, so how do you use it for your own chip work? Um, at the moment, a lot of it has to do with improving communication between uh, chip designers. So uh, you have like a thousand people working on this project and there's a lot of interfaces that need to be described and, um, you know, people have questions. They don't know uh, exactly who to talk to. So basically we're making uh, uh, knowledge bases about our own work that then people uh, can use to answer questions. Um, mm -hmm. And we found that that um, it's kind of like having a, a, a more senior engineer uh, that you can talk to all the time that that helps you uh, find the things you need to find in a, in a huge code base. Um, and so so that's that's the primary thing that we're doing right now is is augmenting uh, the engineers on the team with kind of um, superpowers to understand our own code better and and interact with it better. Uh, over time, I expect that Chip Nemo is going to uh, do other things as well, um, you know, improving the quality of our designs. You know, our Hopper GPUs, for example, have a lot of circuits in them that were designed by AI that we built ourselves uh, that have better um, speed um, and power and cost characteristics than uh, we knew how to build with any other tool. And Wait, I generative AI uh, programs designed some of the chips? Yes, Hopper, Hopper uh, is designed with generative AI. That's insane. It's wild. Yeah. So let's dream a little bit. Uh, Obviously, we, we know that, that like knowledge repositories inside uh, companies is something that this stuff is going to be really good for. Um, maybe a little bit of like uh, consumer agents or consumer chatbots like ChatGPT. Is this where it ends? Like, where do you see it going? I don't think this is where it ends. Um, you know, I've been thinking recently about um, past revolutions in the media space. Um, you know, we, we got books. Uh, which transformed society, you know, when because we could distribute ideas and we could reference the same ideas in a new way because everybody could read the same book, you know. Um, audio, you know, as soon as we got audio recordings, that created an entirely new industry, you know, the recorded music industry, which uh, continues to be totally vibrant and important to our culture. Um, movies, uh, TV, you know, um, every and video games, you know, every, every time that we come up with a new technology, we find a way to explore ideas as humans and explore our culture together uh, in, in a way that like helps us solve problems better and also creates um, a, a new form of culture that, uh, that we interact with. And I think that um, the most exciting applications for AI are ones we haven't really even dreamed up yet in the, in the same way that it would be, it would have been hard um, to imagine how books were going to change the world uh, back when Gutenberg first made the, the press. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, AI is going to create a new form of media that is much more interesting, much more engaging, much more useful. Um, and ultimately, we're going to use that to refine our ideas and explore them together. In the way that we have with other, other media, it's just going to be much more interesting and useful. When I hear you say media, leads me to believe that you think that this is going to be more of like uh, an agent or, or a digital friend that people will start interacting with, right? Because 
that's me media unless is, is there something else or something else i could be thinking about i'm not thinking about that could take the form of media yeah something along those lines i mean i i think you know i'm expecting ai is going to change the lives of all of us here on planet earth and when i think about how eight billion people on this planet live you know most of us aren't reading and writing that much you know um, but we we do love uh, virtual worlds people love interacting in video games we love interacting with each other and I think um, that the primary way that people are going to interact with AI is going to be in virtual worlds, um, because I think that's going to be the most natural way of interaction and the most useful way. And I think we're going to perceive that as a new form of media that that really touches, you know, all aspects of of our work and our play. You know, it's it's going to be uh, something new. So you're you're a real believer in this metaverse vision that you'll just kind of end up in a digital world and the people and the scenery will all be AI generated or maybe mostly AI generated and, and you go. Um, I think that people, um, we, we have a culture, it's very important to us. You know, the, the, the ideas that we share together and the sort of shared humanity that we have is more important to us than uh, the content of uh, the, the things that we're interacting with. So for example, um, AI is probably going to be really awesome at playing soccer. But do I think that people are going to go to watch robots play soccer? Um, even if the robots are kicking around the ball better than humans, I don't think it's as interesting because I don't think that it is related to us. You know, I think the primary thing that we're interested in is ourselves. We're trying to understand ourselves and, and how we relate to other people. I think AI is going to give us new ways of doing that. Um, I think we are going to be uh, interacting in, in virtual worlds. You know, NVIDIA has been uh, uh, a big believer in virtual worlds for, you know, the past 30 years. It's right, something that's been on still, gaming before you were on that's AI. Right. And, and we've had this initiative called the Omniverse uh, long before uh, uh, Meta renamed itself um, uh, because we believe that uh, simulating the world and providing, um, you know, virtual agents a, a place to interact with people um, is is hugely important to the future of technology. And, you know, I, I see these things coming together. I think um, there's a lot of opportunities to use uh, virtual worlds to make AI stronger, to teach AI how to understand the real world and, and act better in the real world. And then, of course, um, uh, giving humans the opportunity to interact with AIs in much more natural and useful ways. I think a lot of that's going to happen in a virtual world. And is that the next place that we go with this, like the world models? Like we just saw Meta put something out where like it's uh, generative or it's not even generative software, but it's AI software can kind of guess like what would happen if you black out like a certain frame in a video. Um, is that is that where the next stage of this goes? I think that's going to be really helpful. Um, you know, these these sorts of world models. Um, you know, I, I was really impressed with the uh, OpenAI Sora project uh, this week as mm -hmm. well. I mean, really fantastic results. And I'm thinking about, you know, uh, how these things work together. So, you know, the Sora project, if you read their post, they talk a lot about how building a world model is going to help uh, make artificial intelligence more useful because it, it you know, it, it's going to understand how things interact in the real world. And then it's going to be able to use that to, to make better decisions in order to do things. Um, so, so I think that's great. Um, and I also think it's uh, the other way it, around is also really important that, you know, having a world model then allows us to synthesize a world, which then uh, allows virtual worlds to be richer, more interesting, more interactive. And I think that's hugely valuable. And how do you train a world model? Like with text, I get text, right? Like you put the text in, it spits the text out. But teaching AI a way to understand what the world looks like is completely different. Yeah. Um, usually the way these work is that there's some sort of implicit learned representation of the world, but we can call it a state space, but it's basically like um, uh, we're trying, like imagine if you could write down uh, every attribute of every object in the world, like where it is, how it's, how it's mm -hmm. moving, what color it is, you know, if you, if you, if you're able to write down, uh, very precisely where every object is, uh, then, uh, you would have a, a good way to draw the world, right? Because you could, you could take that representation and then just turn it into a picture, but then you could also use that to simulate. You could ask a question like, okay, if I took, um, this particular action, 
uh, you know, what would the updated state space look like? You know, so like, for example, if I, if I uh, swing the baseball bat when the ball's right there and I hit, hit the ball, you know, then that's going to be a different future than if I um, swing the ball when the, when the swing the bat when the ball's not there and I, I miss it, right? So um, with a with with a model with a world model like this, you can kind of ask those questions and and then uh, simulate uh, how things go forward in time. Now, one of the tricky things is that um, writing down very precisely all of the state of the world is basically impossible. You know, it's uh, it's way too complex. Um, and you know, this this is for example well known in weather forecasting, right? The idea that like a butterfly flapping its wings in Japan could you know, magnify over the, the, the course of time into like a hurricane on the other side of the world, right? Um, because very small um, changes in the state space of the world could actually have pretty large uh, outcomes. And uh, so, so one of the ways that these learned neural network models are dealing with this is that rather than having an explicit representation of everything in the world, uh, it's all being done implicitly. So the model learns both a function that's that's able to go from uh, some implicit representation of the world to to drawing it, and also from that implicit representation into the future, and and then also um, you know is learning that representation from uh, from the data it's trained on directly. So it's all learned, and that way we don't have to actually try to um, describe the world to the model it, it learns how to describe the world itself i know i'm going to regret asking this question but how does it learn that um <laughs> uh, it starts to get metaphysical for me a little bit you know uh these these models are trained um using stochastic gradient descent so it's um what we're trying to do is um you know uh fit the data that we're given as best we can by um, taking a lot of really small steps to improve the model. So, um, you know, it's kind of like, so gradient descent is, is kind of like um, walking down a mountain. The idea is that like the, the fastest way to walk down the mountain is just look where you are at any moment and find the, the direction that's pointed downward the steepest and, and take a step in that direction. Mm -hmm. Now you can you can tell that this this algorithm isn't very isn't very smart, right? Because if there's a canyon, depending on how big your step is, you might actually step over the canyon, or you might you might get caught, you know, going back and forth when really you should be going down the canyon. And in the spaces that we're optimizing with, you know, let's say a trillion dimensions, right? Um, these kinds of effects are 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 really interesting and 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 difficult to understand, difficult to to relate to. But um, the, the thing that makes this work is that we don't actually have to be super precise about how we update the model for every bit of data it learns. We just kind of do a rough guess about mm -hmm. like this data is pointing the model um, to fit in this particular direction. We'll take a little step that way. And then we're, we're going to do that a lot, you know, and, and that's what we call the stochastic part. So it's, it's a little bit random, um, but uh, it's actually kind of a, a, a great philosophy for life, I think that, um, you know, you could spend an awful lot of time trying to be very precise about what direction to go to make things better. But often the right thing to do is just make a guess, take a step, and then reevaluate what the best direction is next, and then do that a lot. You know, just just be right. really iterative, really flexible. Don't be too wedded to, you know, the idea that you had about where to go at the beginning of the process. Just let the process kind of guide you as you as you uh, walk through it. And that's that's the algorithms that we use um, uh, to train all neural networks. Um, you know, so the specific contents of what the networks are learning are difficult to interpret. We don't have a lot of tools that help us understand that. Uh, in the same way that we don't really understand um, how our own brains work, you know, we we don't really understand all of the things that are happening inside of our heads in order to uh, to allow us to think. Um, it, it's too complicated uh, for for our our analytics at the moment. Yeah, but, but it's the crazy. Thing is, it works. Yeah, it works, and we didn't build the brain, but we did build these systems, and it's working. And we don't know how that's happening, which is which is wild. Okay, I want to talk about uh, reasoning. I want to talk about robotics potentially. And, um, and a few other ways about how companies are going to work with NVIDIA and what might be coming down the pike. So we're going to do that right after the break, coming up right after this. And we're back here on Big Technology Podcast with Brian Catanzaro. He's the Vice President of Applied Deep Learning Research at NVIDIA. Uh, Brian, just to start off, like, what made you think, okay, AI is going to be big enough that I should get to Jensen, CEO of NVIDIA, 
and say, we need to really work hard to make this part of our core offering. I had been spending my um, research career at, at Berkeley as a PhD student on uh, the future of computing. And um, we knew that computing was going to have to change back in 2005 or so. It was obvious that computers would have to be different. The standard way of making computers wasn't working anymore. We would have to be more specific. We'd have to be more parallel. And so I had been spending my time as a grad student thinking about what kinds of applications could take advantage of uh, the computers that will be possible to build, um, but then are going to provide enormous amounts of value to humanity. And at the time, AI was not a very big field. Um, uh, and it wasn't actually super popular to work in it. But when I was thinking about it, I felt like um, from first principles, it made sense to me that this was something that had the potential uh, to really change the world. And, you know, NVIDIA's approach to uh, solving this, I think, was also, you know, fairly careful and iterative, you know. So, um, you know, I, I published my first paper in 2008 on um, machine learning on the GPU. Uh, and NVIDIA uh, really jumped in full steam ahead uh, for the whole company to, to become an AI company in 2013. So it, it took about five years of um, sort of testing that thesis, like, is AI actually going to be something that, that could really change the world? And we started getting some early indicators of success. You know, um, one of those was, of course, the... Um, uh, ImageNet competition in 2012, um, which really shocked the world with the quality of results and wasn't wouldn't have been possible without uh, accelerated computing. You know, the uh, results that they got um, uh, were so incredible because they built a very fast system for training neural nets and uh, trained and that it on wasn't a big generative, right? That was just identifying what was in That's photos. correct. Yeah, it wasn't generative at the time, but you know, um, the the idea of generative AI is is fairly old. I mean, when I was a grad student, generative AI was um, a thing that we talked about all the time. It's just that we weren't using neural nets for it. We were using other models like graphical models. These are other mm -hmm. mathematical approaches that um, are a little bit more clever, um, but don't scale as well. And um, so this was this is another part of the thesis that that um, I had is that. You know, the, the thing that's really going to help AI succeed is um, scale. You know, if we can apply huge data sets and huge amounts of compute to AI, then the results are going to get much better. And this is this is also controversial um, back then. And, and even today, some people really don't like this idea because uh, they would like AI progress to be mostly uh, held back by our smarts, like our mathematical um, skills in, in like coming up with more clever models to describe our data in the world. Um, but it, it does seem uh, these days that there's a lot of evidence that the most important thing is having really good data sets to learn from and then enormous computational scale. And so that was my that was my thesis. And I, you know, I, I was advocating for that at NVIDIA. I wrote this little um, prototype of a library for training neural nets on the GPU, which uh, then became QDNN, which was our very first um, library for uh, for AI on the GPU. And, um, you know, the process of, of uh, getting the company to rally around that and, and, and build that as a product and ship it, you know, it took some time. Um, but because there were these, um, you know, early indicators of success that there was a lot of uh, demand picking up, um, even back then, uh, it, it made sense for the company to, to really pay attention. And then, you know, Jensen, himself is such a visionary. I remember when he first started interacting with me about this back in 2012, I, um, I felt like uh, he was just so hungry to learn, you know, so I felt like I, I gave him all the things that I learned from my PhD in the course of like an hour about like, um, how AI could change NVIDIA's business and what uh, NVIDIA could potentially build. And my ambitions for what that meant were like, a thousand times smaller than Jensen's were, you know, um, he, he took it immediately and then elaborated on it and thought about where is this going? Um, you know, one of the things he first said back in 2012 was, um, uh, this is an entirely new way of writing software rather than having humans enumerate all the different cases that software needs to understand. We're going to have, uh, models that learn, uh, from, from our data, how to solve problems. And, um, these days that sounds like, the truth, right? Like we, we see that happening every day when we interact with these models. But, you know, uh, 12 years ago, 
uh, that was a pretty bold thing to say. And I was a little bit nervous about it because, um, you know, the history of AI uh, over the past, you know, 70 years had been one of um, over promising and under delivering in a lot of ways, which yeah, then been many a lot of booms and busts. Right? Yeah. A lot Where of people AI like think it can do something and then just totally dry it up until That's it starts right. to prove itself again. And so when when Jensen like immediately glommed onto this and started like um, uh, thinking about what it what it could mean, I wanted to slow him down a little bit and be like Jensen, like this is a this is a big huge idea, but like I'm not sure if it's going to happen now. It might be 30 years from now, you know. Um, but uh, it turns out that Jensen was right about this. Uh, this was the right time um, to apply enormous data and enormous compute to AI and get these results. Right, but 2012 wasn't. I mean, it took another. 10 years, 30, 11 years, really, for yep. the boom to come. So what did it feel NVIDIA, like? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think NVIDIA is uh, really good at decade-long technology development. I've seen that happen at NVIDIA many times. You know, uh, ray tracing, I was in meetings in 2008 with Jensen on ray tracing, and we launched our first ray tracing GPU in 2018. You know, it took 10 years of continuous development and research in order to make uh, ray traced virtual worlds a reality and uh, CUDA itself, you know, uh, the the projects that led to CUDA, uh, they started in the early 2000s. CUDA was released as a beta in 2006. Right. I and think this is it the wasn't... software that all AI programming is done with on with the H100s pretty much and A100s. Right. Yeah. CUDA is our, our, our framework for programming the GPU and making it do stuff that's interesting. And yeah. um, and, uh, you know, that that project um, was crazy for a long time. You know, Wall Street hated it because it subtracted value from our earnings reports. Like they looked at the costs of our products and they're like, these products are too expensive. Your margins are too low. You know, back then the margins were quite low. And that's because, um, you know, there wasn't the applications and the ecosystem that we're using CUDA yet in order for us to, uh, you know, build a strong business around it. But uh, NVIDIA continued investing in CUDA in, uh, in the, the libraries, the software, the compilers, the frameworks, and of course, also the chips uh, for 10 years, you, you know, actually maybe more than 10 years before uh, all of a sudden CUDA became an overnight success. You know, it's like 10 years of hard work that everyone ignored and Wall Street mm -hmm. criticized NVIDIA for mercilessly. Why are you wasting your time on this? You know, everybody knows the GPU is just for gamers. Why are you trying to make the GPU do something else? And, you know, we did it anyway. And, you know, that's one of the things I love about uh, this company. I think it's one of the reasons why we're successful at the Accelerated Computing Mission is that when we decide to do something, we do it out of our convictions about how technology will unfold. And we base those convictions on a speed of light analysis about what's what's actually possible uh, to try to, to keep ourselves honest. And then, you know, when once we have that conviction, we're able to follow through. What did you see in those years that everybody gave up on this? I mean, obviously, there were big advances that were made in things like machine learning, right? Like computer vision and natural language processing. And that's where we had Facebook really take the lead as the public spokesperson for this stuff, talking about uh, image recognition. And they even built this um, fake generative chatbot called M that I had access to that basically would be like, it's supposed to be a large language model. We didn't even know it was going to be large language models of pre-transformer, right? But like you would talk to this bot and it would talk back and they were trying to figure out like what people were interested in, if they're going to build a bot. And they had this whole bot platform that came out. But overall, like everyone's telling you, yeah, this is not worth building. I mean, it's maybe just one or two companies that are using it. So why did you still think that, I mean, I guess it's hard to predict what happened next, but why did you believe that that was going to happen? NVIDIA really thinks about these problems from first principles. You know, we know that um, the way that computers are built is changing. We know that um, because of, you know, Moore's law is, is slowing down, that requires more specialization. Um, we know that uh, there's a lot of opportunities to really provide transformational uh, speed ups to important workloads if we specialize the systems and the software for them. And uh, we felt like what is more important than this? You know, what's more important than intelligence? And does the world need more intelligence? Absolutely. The world needs enormous amounts of intelligence, like the problems that we face 
um, as a planet, uh, I think we're, we're going to need a lot of intelligence to work through them. And so uh, for us, it was, I think, just kind of an obvious thing to do. Um, we had a lot of conviction. We, we understood the technology. We also saw early indicators of success from a lot of different um, directions, you know, a lot of different companies, a lot of research institutions that um, were talking to us and saying, hey, we, um, we have these goals to like train this huge language model, like on enormous amounts of text, but you know, the, the current systems are just too slow. And, um, you know, there's this idea, you know, back 10 years ago, there was this idea that unsupervised learning was going to change the world, but nobody knew how, you know, unsupervised learning, meaning that rather than having humans go in and label every picture, is it a cat, is it a dog, that's supervised learning. We're just going to show the model, all the pictures that we can find, and the model is going to learn itself something about pictures that then we can use to solve problems. You know, that idea has been around for decades. Um, but actually turning it into something that worked, uh, you know, that's only happened over the past 10 years. And I think it's only happened because of, um, you know, the increases in scale that we've been able to bring to the problem. So during that 10 years, you know, we saw continuous improvement, um, even if the rest of the world uh, didn't see it. I think um, one of the one of the things about technology when it's growing on um, an exponential curve is that the, the beginning of it feels like nothing's happening outside, you know? So e exponential curves, the, the hockey stick kind of curve, it looks like nothing, 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 all of a sudden, huge success, you know? That's, that's kind of what the exponential curve looks like. But the interesting thing about an exponential curve is that the rate of progress is constant, you know? It's always getting, you know, let's say 10% better. Like every, every year, it's just 10% better, right? And so so you can tell that you can see like, wow, this technology, it's continuing to improve, even if uh, it's not reached the point where it's useful for, for the world yet. Uh, we we right. just have this confidence that it would. So people had this basically large, you know, swaths of text and they're like, we want to build something like a large language model, but it just wasn't available yet. Uh, did you guys notice when uh, in 2017, the paper attention is all you need comes out? from Google, Absolutely. which is like the basic. So what was the reaction internally? Because even within Google, I'll say this, I've spoken with people within Google, it was not a yawn, but it was like, uh, okay, not a like, holy crap moment. But I'm curious <laughs> what happened within NVIDIA because it's sort of, you know, your bread and butter. Yeah, absolutely. And that that paper caught our attention immediately because of the implications for our entire business. So, you know, I, I told you earlier, accelerated computing is not about the chips. Um, and this is a great example of that. Like if we built a system that is for, let's say, ResNet 50, which in 2017, that was the most most widely, you know, uh, talked about kind of neural network is these image classification networks. If, if we built systems to accelerate that, that would be a really different kind of system than a system designed to accelerate transformers. And so we have to ask this question, you know, what's going to be the future? What's going to drive uh, demand? What, how are we going to build um, the right technology to accelerate the things that will matter a few years from now? And so, of course, we're always asking ourselves that question, you know, is there something coming along that's going to um, uh, change the way that people build AI. And if there is, then we need to think about what are the implications for the systems that we're building. Um, so yeah, we saw that paper. Um, I have to say that the title is a little bit like maybe of a, a pill to swallow because, it, you know, the attention <laughs> is all you need. It's like, yeah. but is it, you know, like it, it kind of, it kind of elicits that reaction from a lot of people. But um, the thing that was really attractive about um, transformers to us was that we knew that they had really favorable computational properties. And um, again, going back to this thesis that the model is a little bit is the model is less important than the data and the compute that goes into training the model. If you have a model that has really excellent um, uh, compute properties that allows you to scale uh, really well, efficiently to, you know, many thousand of GPUs, the kinds of results you can get from that, um, are pretty, pretty spectacular. So we, we saw that early on. That's and what we, the transformer model did. That's what this yeah. paper attention is all you need sort yeah. of architected. Absolutely. And, and so we saw that it had the potential to do that. And so we were very curious about it. And, you know, um, uh, in my team, we had our own language models team back in 2017. 
And at the time we were using recurrent neural networks, which were the, the standard way of doing things before the transformer paper came out. And, um, and so I, I asked an intern, uh, Hey, can you, uh, take a look at doing language modeling with transformers? I'm hearing good things about it. Uh, it would be great for us to have an independent perspective on whether this is a good idea. And he came back, uh, you know, a month or two later with just really astonishing results. You know, wow. it was, it, there, there was no question that it was better, uh, than the models that we were using and also that it was more scalable. So we were able to, to train bigger and smarter models because of that scalability. And so, um, so that was really important, um, for, for us. And then, you know, the whole company kind of paid attention to the way that transformers were changing AI and, and then started, you know, building systems to help, uh, make that even better. Should Google have open sourced it? I mean, they haven't gotten the most value out of it. You know, others have gotten more value out of that paper. I can't really speculate on uh, Google's business or, or, you know, whether they should or shouldn't have done things. I think, um, uh, if Google had not open sourced that or had not uh, published that paper, um, uh, but if we started seeing like incredible language modeling results, um, uh, we would have figured out some sort of a model that had good scalable properties that um, mm -hmm. uh, that could help with this um, space. And, you know, there's not just right. one transfer. So it wouldn't model. have made there's a difference. Variation. Yeah. I think ultimately the community would have figured something out because it's so right. important, you know, yep. I think Google deserves a ton of credit for doing that work first and for publishing that paper. So you, you basically build the, um, you know, you're building, uh, you know, for this world of AI, you see the transformer model come out, you shift, you, you incorporate it, you start to see the GPTs from open AI. Is that the next big moment on this journey? Where you're like, oh, this could be, this could be, because it was interesting. Speaking again about like what people saw from the outside, we all knew that tech, you know, OpenAI was doing text generation, but it didn't really click for most people until it became a chatbot. So, what did it look like for you when it was just like, you know, you've been watching this the whole time? What did it look like on your end? Yeah, well, you know, I'd been watching OpenAI's work in language modeling uh, since before GPT. I don't know if you recall, they had this sentiment neuron project, um, which I thought was really cool because it was doing unsupervised uh, modeling of text. And then they were able to find that um, just by showing the model a lot of text, that all of a sudden the model had started to understand high level concepts about text. Like, for example, what kind of emotion is being expressed inside of this text? And that was a really interesting thing because, like I said, unsupervised learning, the idea had been around for a long time that um, we would make a lot more progress as a field if we were able to do unsupervised learning. But um, actually figuring out how to practically get some value out of just showing a lot of data to a model, uh, it wasn't very obvious to everybody. And uh, so when I saw that um, that unsupervised um a sentiment neuron project from OpenAI. I thought that was really interesting, and they followed that up with uh, the G the first GPT paper, um, which kind of applied transformers to this, and in the process, you know, made a much better um, sort of text analytics model. G the first GPT one, you know, it was it was really kind of using a generative model more for classification than for generation. It was more like, you know, can we use a generative uh, pre-trained model to understand text rather than can we use it to create text? Because at the time, right. uh, creating text seemed too hard. And then of course, um, you know, GPT-2 came out and had uh, really astonishing text generation capabilities. And not just that, but also already had started to learn things about the world that um, were very difficult to teach any AI system before. I remember they had this story about unicorns in South America being studied by some university professor and, and th that the model could remember that like in South America, people speak Spanish and, you know, there's a country in South America called Peru and like there's mountains in that country. And, you know, it's like, wow, the, the amount of facts that this model is able to recall after only being trained on an enormous amount of text is really shocking. Right. What do you Me? think when people say that it's just these models just predict the next word? Don't get too excited about it. I mean, the, what the, what you're describing, it seems like something more. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always possible to, to get very reductive with systems. I mean, you could say that um, I'm just meat, right? <laughs> I'm just <laughs> I'm just a monkey made of meat. And like, yeah. you know, everything that's happening in my head is also just energy minimization. Like there's chemistry happening in right. my head. And I had someone who used to... to tell me that, yeah, love is not love. It's just a chemical. I think you're totally it's just right. A chemical. Like, 
yes, it's a chemical, but also there might be, there's something more here. So you're saying with LLMs. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, the, so, so the fact that chemistry is involved uh, in our own consciousness doesn't make our consciousness less interesting to me. The fact right. that like, you know, neural networks are trained to predict the next word and, and you know, and that may not be like the ultimate way of training them. You know, we're learning mm -hmm. how to do this, right? So maybe we'll come up with a better way tomorrow. I'm not attached to that particular way, but I also don't think that understanding a little bit of how something works takes away from the magic. Right. Okay. So we have just a few minutes left. I want to ask you a couple more questions. Uh, Chat GPT, when that comes out, I mean, obviously you had already been pretty impressed by GPT one and two. We're already at three, three and a half, right? By the time Chat GPT comes out in November 2022, and then this stuff explodes. Your reaction? Yeah. Like, what, what was it uh, like sitting where you were? It was just extraordinary. I mean, the amount of change that Chat GPT brought to the world, uh, incredible. I didn't, I thought it was kind of cheeky of OpenAI to release it at the same time as the NeurIPS conference because, um, you know, usually the AI world is entirely focused on like the cool papers that are coming out at the conference, but instead the entire world was focused on this chatbot, you know, that was doing things that, you know, no one had ever seen a chatbot do before. And, uh, you know, to me, that was a statement that we were entering a new era of AI where applied research um, uh, starts to dominate, you know, so uh, ChatGPT didn't come out with a fully fledged academic paper that described exactly what they did to make it so awesome. Um, but because it, the results were so strong, it kind of dominated the, the academic discussion. And um, I felt like that that was really interesting um, in terms of a, a water watermark, a watershed moment for um, uh, sort of the maturity of the AI industry, you know, that that it was now possible um, to create systems that would solve problems in ways that we'd never seen before um, uh, if we we applied some really good engineering and, and applied research to it. Um, and so that, um, you know, definitely, definitely changed the world. And, and since then, you know, uh, my world has been just continuously on fire. You know, every day I open my email, there's a new awesome result. It's really exciting times. And working at NVIDIA, one of my favorite things about working at NVIDIA is that we get to um, collaborate with people from all sorts of companies and institutions, and we get to sort of rejoice in the good work that's happening around the industry. Because um, at the at the end of the day, you know, it's it's really exciting to see AI flourish. That's our mission is to, is to make AI flourish everywhere. And um, and so so when I open my email and see all these great results, uh, it, it always makes me happy. Do you think that we're going to get to artificial intelligence that's on par or greater than human level intelligence? I don't really like that question because I don't know what human intelligence really is. Um, for example, I think that Cardi B is extremely intelligent. Um, she is able to capture the attention of hundreds of millions of people by doing things that I'm not exactly sure why they're so interesting, but they totally are, right? There's a lot of people that would love to do that, but don't have the kind of intelligence that she does in order to make that work. What is Cardi B's SAT score? I have no idea. It's not very interesting. To me. Well, yeah, there's what? book smarts and emotional smarts and exactly. other forms of brilliance. There's there's eight billion forms of brilliance on this planet. This you is know? the thing, though. These models are getting good at everything, right? <laughs> making they're making music, they're writing books, they're making videos. So there's a, a world there where you could say it can approximate. There's a chance. I mean, getting just to the baseline of human intelligence is one thing, but there's a chance that this stuff can maybe even exceed some of our most talented. Well, and it, People it already in all has. spectrums. Well, it you know, um, AI has been smarter than humans at, at uh, many things for a long time. I mean, when I was in high school, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess, right? Did that mean that humans stopped playing chess? No. Actually, it changed the way humans played chess. It made humans play chess better because humans had new tools to learn. They had AI to help them learn how to play chess. And the reason we play chess isn't to win. You know, we play chess because... It's part of our culture because it's interesting, because we like the challenge, because we like the interaction, you know, that because it's it's what we're doing as humans is exploring, you know, what it, what does it mean to exist? Um, I don't think that AI challenges that. I, you know, I've I've been in a lot of rooms with a lot of smart people. I don't think that it's necessary for me to be the smartest person in order to have value or to, um, you know, be interested or engaged in no way. something that's I, going I on. I never want to be the smartest person in a room because I'm not <laughs> learning that way. Right. 
Exactly. So I'm not I'm not threatened by this. Um, AI, so my thesis is AI has always been smarter than us at some things. The number of things that it's getting better better at us is is getting larger, but that doesn't threaten me. Um, I'm not worried about being obsolete in the same way that I don't think an oak tree is obsolete. What does it mean for a tree to be obsolete? Like, how do you measure the worth of a tree? Like, are we going to just talk about how tall yeah. it is or like, you know, how many leaves it has and count them and say, well, this tree is worth more because it has more leaves and it made that other one. It's just not a very interesting question to me. Well, it's so interesting that you're going straight to obsolescence where like some might say this is actually, you know, if we if AI equals human intelligence, it's not a bad thing. Like maybe there's actually like, yeah, yeah, it becomes well, I, I think a tool for us. I, I think it is a tool for us. Um, but it is interesting. It's for the way that it's portrayed. We'll just take these conversations often to the obsolescence part. I don't, I don't really fear that either. I don't either. You know, one person that I, I really love the, his thoughts on this is um, Jürgen Schmidt Huber. And he has said multiple times that a truly intelligent AI is going to be, first of all, um, not very interested in, living on the surface of planet earth because it can beam itself over the radio at the speed of light anywhere. Um, and, uh, it can live underground. In fact, underground and different places is better. There's more yeah. resources outside of the crust of planet earth where we live. And so, um, mm -hmm. I, I think that, um, you know, we don't, we don't have a lot to fear. I think the, the scariest thing for me is, um, you know, are we, are we gonna, um, you know, not, figure out how to use this technology um, because I think we desperately need it. I think our world desperately needs more intelligence. And, and so yeah, that's our I, mission. Yeah, I've, I've been emailing with Jurgen trying to get him on the show. So you're reminding me a, to follow up here. I don't know, maybe you can help, help me put a good word. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, great yeah, speaking great. with you. Thanks so much for joining. Great, great to have yeah, you on the show. Thank you, Alex. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time on Big Technology Podcast.